Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back in our Father's Word, the book of Job. Now let's refresh just a little bit here. What is it that Job means in the Hebrew tongue? Persecuted. And God allowed this book, spoke through this book, allowing others to speak as well, whereby you would have an exercise in actual life of who to listen to and who not to listen to when you were persecuted, to be able to discern spiritually what was causing your problems, whether it was father's chastisement, whether it was Satan's action against you, you being one of God's chosen elect, and how you should deal with it. So for a troubled life, you'll never find a better book than Job if you will really absorb the message within it, knowing how to deal with the enemy. We have an advantage in this generation and have since Christ's crucifixion in as much as he gave us power in his name over all our enemies. So that gives us quite an advantage. Job did not have that advantage. It was strictly a conflict between God and Satan, and Job was the subject. He was the one that God had said, he's my man. He can handle it. He can cut it. So that's what he kind of expects out of his election is somebody that can think on their feet, can discern spiritually, and that God can trust. That's why he picked in the first earth age when they stood against Satan, as it's written concerning Jeremiah, In chapter 1 in the great book of Jeremiah, verses 1 through about 6, he said, hey, I knew you before you were ever in your mother's womb. And he knew he could handle himself. Okay, with that having been said, Job's three friends have retired, so to speak. They're only listeners now. And a younger person comes along under the handle of Elihu. Elihu meaning God is him or El is God. <clears throat> and he said, I was young, I stayed, stood back, I listened, and now I want to tell you. And he come down on Job real hard. And actually there's no difference in him and the three ratchet jaws that came on first. It's obvious he's a liar. And you want, this is why God wants you to be able to discern because you could teach part of these scriptures and say, there it is right there in the Bible. Well, there's just one thing. A liar made the statement. So God wants you to be on guard and to be able to discern and think for yourself as to whether it's God speaking or man speaking. If God's speaking, that's okay. You can listen. You can count on it. But if it's some man giving a report, then you'd better be careful. That's how traditions get uh, had their beginning. So with that said, a word of wisdom from our Father teaching us discernment and, um, and to remain focused on the Word of God and the message He would um, uh, alleviate to us from His Holy Word, the lessons learned that will strengthen you in life. We ask that in Yeshua's name. Chapter 36, verse 1, let's go with it. Elihu continues preaching to Job. And again, this is not the word of God, but this is the words of a man, Elihu, rather. Okay, and verse 1 reads, Elihu also proceeded and said, he didn't stop. Boy, he was long-winded. Two, suffer me a little. You, You bear with me just a little bit longer here, and I will show thee that I have yet to speak on God's behalf. Now, now, friend, I don't know of any man that I would want to hear speak on God's behalf. You know, God has always been able to speak for himself, either through the Word or through the Holy Spirit. Uh, It's been 
a considerable time since God has set aside a man that he actually spoke through. So when, when you hear someone say that, if I were you, I would let the red flags go up all over the place. This dude is going to speak on God's behalf, and he's already showed himself up as a fool. So he that listens to a fool is a greater fool than the fool. So that's what you want to be very careful of. Discern the Word of God. Rightly discern. Rightly divide. And you'll be far wiser for it. So having said that, verse 3, I will fetch my knowledge from afar. Well, it's a good thing he can because he hasn't shown any thus far. And will ascribe righteousness to my maker. Well, that that's never hurts because God is the maker of all and he deserves righteousness. The reason I want to throw that in is many times man will give you about 95% absolute truth. It's that 5% you want to be real careful of because it makes void basically everything he says as far as your trust is concerned. Verse 4, For truly my word shall not be false. He that is perfect in knowledge is with thee. Now, boy, I tell you what, you talk about a man bragging on himself. Perfect in knowledge? I mean, I would think that anyone that read that in English, Hebrew, uh, Latin, Greek, whatever they wanted, whatever language they wished to read it, it would automatically say there's only one that speaks like that aside from God and Christ, and that's Satan. It was Satan's pride in himself that brought him down. And certainly we see here, I mean, you know, when a man says, truly my word shall not be false, that's kind of guaranteeing he's going to tell the truth. And he that is perfect in knowledge is with thee. Boy, hey, you know, that's, that's flying high. Verse 5, behold, God is mighty. That's true. And despiseth not any. He is mighty in strength and wisdom. Truer words could not be spoken. But following a falsehood or a braggart, a statement that is braggart-like, then you want, again, can you discern? Verse 6, He preserveth not the life of the wicked, but giveth right to the poor. Uh, that's to say those that are afflicted. Now, understand, the entire, here we're in the 36th chapter, and the question has been, why is Job in this condition? Why has he lost everything that he owned, including his family? And so far, the, uh, a person being wicked is the answer that has come up. So here we have Elihu is no different. He gives the reputation of God, and that reputation is true. And then he said, God preserves the life, uh, not rather the life of the wicked, meaning everything Job had was certainly not preserved because it was gone. In other words, he's calling Job a wicked person. And here through about 7 through 12, you're going to see him make accusations against Job that are rather bitter. Verse 7, he withdraweth not his eyes from the righteous. God doesn't let anything happen to the very righteous. But with kings are they on the throne. Yea, he doth establish them forever, and they are exalted. Now, do you believe that? Do you call that a true statement? Of course it isn't. Those that uh, serve God in righteousness, Satan nips at them every time he gets a chance. And um, certainly God doesn't guard over any of his election every moment of the day and keep wickedness away from them. He doesn't do that. Because occasionally he put us in this world that we could live in this world and master this world with the aid of our Father and the Son. All right? But that doesn't mean trouble's not coming your way. And if it does, that doesn't mean you're wicked necessarily. But again, he's, he is saying here, Job, God takes care of the righteous, so what are you? You're trash, son. You're nothing. Verse 8. 
my words, but the implication is there. Verse 8. And if they be bound in fetters and be holden in cords of affliction, 9, then he showeth them their work and their transgressions that they have exceeded. Transgressions? That's transgressions against God's law? In other words, if, if you're down and out and if you're being punished, certainly God is showing you your transgressions, Job. You should be, I mean, this man of great wisdom is telling him this. Has he mentioned Satan? No, he hasn't. And one of the greatest tricks of Satan, and you should learn this lesson well, is for someone to think he doesn't exist. Boy, that gives him, that's like the invisible enemy working in your own camp undetected. That, that gives him free reign. So understand, God's doing all this through the mouth of this one, and supposedly he's speaking for God. Verse 10, he openeth also their ear to discipline and commandeth that they return from iniquity. And poor old Job sitting there. I mean, what's the difference? Job, you should. God, if you were righteous, would open your ears and you would leave your sin behind you, boy. Verse 11, if they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. Now, here poor Job again, I'm repeating myself, but I want you to see what type individual this is who comes in the name of God. you got a lot of preachers today you want to watch out for that are uneducated in God's word and yet they will handily and boldly step forward to represent God. God sent you this letter personally, whereby you could forearm yourself with the gospel armor, which in part is this word, whereby you couldn't be deceived by some character such as Elihu. Because God let you in and you are privy to what's happening in chapter 1, and in chapter 2, verse 7, we know that Satan is doing all of this. Not because Job was wicked, but because Job was good, because Job was righteous. It is a conflict that has carried on since the garden itself, and it still continues to this day. I don't know, how are you doing? It's a good question. Verse 12. But if they obey not, if, they, if, if a, a man won't listen to God, they shall perish by the sword and they shall die without knowledge. Now, that's, you know, that's really a compliment to good old Job that he's supposed to be helping. Job had more knowledge. Remember, Job was a respected elder and no reason, the reason this man held his peace until the elders finished talking is because Job was the chief elder. And as soon as he lost the material things, the people of the community lost their respect for Job just knowing he had sinned above all sins. Um, don't let people play games with you. Grow familiar with your father's letter and know your enemies. Christianity is not a religion, it's a reality. It's in your daily life. Make certain that you forearm yourself and you stay that way. Chapter thir Verse 13, rather. Chapter 36, verse 13, and it reads, But the hypocrites in heart heap up wrath. In, in, in other words, the godless are proud and they think up stuff in their mind. The heart would better translate mind. They cry not when he bindeth them. They're just uh, proudful, and of course that would be Satan's number one uh, fault. So it has his earmarks right on it. 14. They die in youth, and their life is among the unclean. And this is a terrible insult. It means the word in the Hebrew is sodomites perversiveness. Now, he's really crossed the bounds here of even being a friend because one friend wouldn't say that to another. Verse 15, 
In other words, this is implying that Job participates in all this. 15. He delivereth the poor in his affliction and openeth their eyes in oppression. In other words, those that are humble, if they obey God, he's going to get, deliver them from it. What's your case, Job? Here you sit in ashes. 16. Even so, would he have removed thee, that's to say Job, out of the strait into a broad place where there is no straightness, and that which should be set on thy table shall be full of fatness. Now, you know, it should have happened to you, Job, but look at you. Now, I, I can't think of anything. You, you take, a, if a man is down and his friends come to build him up, now this, how, would this, how would this leave you? I don't think it would build you up. He, when he said, I am a man of great wisdom and I'm going to speak in the place of God, he blew it coming out the gate. No man can speak for God. Man can teach God's word. The Holy Spirit can speak for the Father. But no mortal man can speak for God. A mortal man can teach God's word. A mortal man can say, teach, thus saith the Lord. But to stand up and say that he has the authority to speak for God in God's place, I want you to understand what I'm saying, because many won't. But when a man claims that he can speak in God's stead, don't listen to him. I mean, he's already proved that. You'll find that by the last word in verse 14. You don't need friends like that. Verse 17. And thou hast fulfilled the judgment of the wicked. Judgment and justice take hold on thee. I mean, you know, again, if you got a friend like that, you don't need an enemy. All right. 18. Because there is wrath, beware lest he take thee away with his stroke, and then a great ransom cannot deliver thee. You want to beware, Job, and you want to listen to these words of wisdom coming out of my mouth or God will send a stroke upon you you won't recover from. Now that reminds me of the old boy that writes these letters around to poor, unaware people saying, I had a dream from God that an evil was upon your house. Send money. You know, what a, what a fool. And I would, I would say again, don't listen to fools. Listen to your father's word and gain knowledge whereby you have understanding of the word that um, you can divide fools from people that are truly friends. Verse 19, will he esteem thy riches? Question. No, not gold, nor all the forces of strength. 20. Desire not the night when people are cut off in their place. In other words, night is what? It's darkness. Job, don't, don't desire darkness whereby you can continue your wickedness. 21. Take heed. You be careful. Regard not iniquity, for this hast thou chosen rather than affliction. Now, I, again, I am amazed at the words of this person. Here he flat out tells Job, not judging him, but declaring, it's obvious you have chose the path of sin rather than righteousness. That, that it was your own choice. The word choice is your key word. Now, if I were in Job's place here, it's about this time I would have ended. His, his mouth speaking in the stead of God would have been closed, I guarantee you. But Job was a very patient person. Maybe that's why God used him. 22. Behold, God exalteth by his power who teacheth like him. And I'm sure that uh, this little dude thinks he does. All right, He thinks he's speaking for God. God exalteth by power. And you know what? It's a true statement. He does. But you still have this little conflict in the spiritual realm, which is not visible to the naked eye, I will say, to the spiritual eye it is. 
in discernment. But this war continues on, and it is awesome. And that battle must be fought, and God chooses people that are able to fight it. So Job, through much suffering and pain, teaches us a lesson that, uh, that God utilizes him to teach you a lesson today. But you don't have to put up with that stuff, okay? That you can be intelligent enough to absorb your father's letter and see what a bunch of ratchet jaws will do to you if you allow it. You don't have to. In other words, the implication here is, Job, you're a sorry lot because God has the power to raise you up if you were good. Verse 23, who hath enjoined him his way? Or who can say, thou hast wrought iniquity? 20, 24, remember that thou magnifiest his work which men behold. In other words, you know that God never makes a mistake, Job and God punishes wickedness, where, where do you think you're getting off, Job, when you say, I've not committed sin? Now, you see, he thinks he's pretty wise, and he shows his stupidity in that he tries to take the place of God. That is the height of sin, is to try to replace God. That's why Satan is in the position he is today. 24, remember that thou magnifieth his work, which men behold. 25, every man may see it, man may behold it afar off. Man can see, Job, that you're a sorry sinner from a long distance by just looking at you. Some men are not really all that sharp at discernment, I, I guarantee you. Few people can tell discern uh, the workings of Satan and the workings of God. If you're certainly not familiar with the controversy and um, the action that has taken place from the garden thus far, you, I guarantee you, you're probably in the dark. Verse 26, behold, God is great. Well, that's a true statement. You can, you can count on that. And we know him, <clears throat> excuse me, and we know him not. Neither can the number of his years be searched out. Now, finally, he has made a true statement. But I, I, want to, I want to ask you a question. I want to see how sharp you are. Elihu states, behold, God is great. Oh, that's 100%. That's true. And we know him not. Well, it's obvious this turkey doesn't. But let me ask you a question. How can this turkey, Elihu, be representing God when he doesn't even know him. I mean, how sharp are you? Be careful when you listen to men. Men will be quite truthful to you, and this, this dude just spilt it right from his own mouth. He doesn't know God, so how possibly could he be speaking in God's stead? He couldn't. That's an impossibility. Now, this, this is excluding the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit can speak through whomever he chooses. But the Holy Spirit did not appear on this earth, uh, that is to say, to help man in that sense and in that role as our advocate until 40 days past the crucifixion. I mean, the guy finally is really, he did not know God. He said we couldn't know God. Well, he couldn't, not with his frame of mind. He never will unless he has a change of heart. 27, excuse me. For he make us small the drops of water that pour down rain according to the vapor thereof. Hey, that's true. He can even make it down to a little fine mist if he chooses. That's a true statement. And I want you to remember these statements because God himself in chapter 38 We'll repeat some of them, declaring, do you know how that happens? This boy, this boy will be finished by that time, though. Verse 28. When the clouds do drop and distill upon man abundantly. Now, God can do that. 
29, also, can any understand the spreadings of the clouds or the noise of his tabernacle? Meaning, the spreading of the clouds. Let's just picture, if you would, a nice, good old group of Columbia, uh, Numio, Columbia, Colum, uh, Numio Cumulus clouds. I'll say it here in a moment, which we call a good old thunderstorm. And, and what's this noise? It's thunder. You know, it's awesome, powerful. All right. Yeah, he can do that. How does he do that? Well, we, with science, we pretty well understand, uh, but uh, only he can do it. 30. Behold, he spreadeth his light upon it. The lightning flashes through it and covereth the bottom of the sea. In other words, the sea is dark. It's one of the darkest when you get in certain places, but when that lightning flashes above it, it, it triangles and beams and lights even the sea to, in depths to a degree. 31. For by them judgeth he the people. He giveth meat in abundance. In other words, he can give both meat and he can deliver punishment, Job. Again, he's kind of back on this, Job, you're going to have to make up your mind, all right? 32. With clouds he covereth the light and commandeth it not to shine by the cloud that cometh betwixt. In other words, he can throw an overcast over the earth where the sun, the sunlight, can't shine through. And at the same time, verse 23, the noise or the thunder thereof showeth concerning it, the cattle also concerning the vapor. Uh, this is really a poor translation. What it says is that God can take the lightning bolts in his two hands and direct it to strike wherever he chooses it to. It's like his weapon, all right? And that the cattle themselves can tell by the, the vapor or the scent, the ionization of lightning uh, as the only form of natural nitrogen drifts to the earth following the storm. Now, <clears throat> Can we go out then and preach for a fact that God does this? No, you cannot. Well, why can't I? It's right there in the Bible. Because it wasn't God's word. If you believe that, if you believe that God actually grabs the lightning bolt and directs it to strike whomever he chooses, if you think he would do that, you're, you're teaching it not from Almighty God, but you're teaching it from Elihu's mouth claiming he's speaking in the place of God. I'm just, I'm using this exercise to show you how easily man, if he's not familiar with the word, we could, we could pick up a Bible in many, let's just go to many places of worship. We could pick up God's word and we could open to chapter 36 and we could begin reading with 31 and preach quite a sermon. There it is, written right in the Word of God. It's what the Word says. Well, it's not what the Word of God said. You, you don't really have to be too bright a person to know God didn't say that. Elihu did. And God's going to give his expression of Elihu and those other three turkeys in a minute. That is to say, in a, probably about the next lecture. As a matter of fact, he doesn't have a good thing to say for them. And you would preach a sermon from that? How, you know, would you know the difference if you walked into an establishment and they crap, cracked open the Bible right there and begin to preach from it and say, thus saith the Lord? That's why God placed the book of Job here for. You know, in some ways I really enjoy teaching the uh, book of Job. But one of the reasons is we've got 38 chapters minus the first two. That is just a bunch of ratchet join, men saying things, half-truths, all truths and lies. And we have to discern between. And pretty soon, you know, if you can't trust what a man says, you shouldn't listen to him at all. So, in a sense, it's rewarding 
but it is a lesson, especially in this generation, that is foremost, that you learn who to listen to. And I hope that uh, now that we have completed the 36th chapter, that it is settled in your mind deep down that you don't listen to man, you listen to God. That you beware of Satan. You see, he's the root of the trouble here. And out of 36 chapters so far, no one has mentioned him as accusing him. Why? Because Satan, that is one of his titles, is the accuser. So beware and be careful, my friend. It's a lesson well learned. It will, it, you will find within the book of Job the answer to many hardships and be able to recover from it at uh, max speed when you utilize the tools God has given you to defeat the enemy with. Chapter 37, verse 1. At this also my heart trembleth and is moved out of his place. Oh, isn't that sad? That is just, I mean, that, it has just really touched me, Job. Oh, boy. To hear attentively the noise of his voice and the sound that goeth out of his mouth. In other words, when you hear that that is nature and God speaking the thunder, you listen. Three, he directed it under the whole heaven and his lightning upon the ends of the earth. He lets it loose. He lets it fly. Four, after it, a voice roareth. When you see the lightning, pretty soon you're going to hear the thunder. That's smart. Yeah. He thundereth with the voice of his excellency, and he will not stay them when uh, his way is heard. Uh, so we got a regular little thunderstorm going on. It probably was a real, uh, very impressive to the end of his speech here. Don't forget that. Verse 5, God thundereth marvelously with his voice. Great things doeth he, which we cannot comprehend. Now he finally gets around to admitting it. Instead of speaking in God's place, you know, I really don't understand this. Well, that's very obvious he doesn't. All right. Uh, and I'm just helping the boy out as though he needed it. Six. For he saith to the snow, Be thou on the earth, likewise to the small rain and to the great rain of his strength. Hey, that's true. Uh, God arranges nature or has arranged nat nature whereby when the canopy was removed, we picked up a jet stream, uh, two, three, that actually control the movement of temperature, the winds, and thus even the moisture. That in the creation itself, he doesn't have to move each little one, in the creation itself, it was predetermined. And finally, we begin through La Nina and El Nino to understand a little more about nature and why things happen as they do. Verse 7. He sealeth up the hand of every man that all men may know his work. Well, that would be really great if that were a true statement. If you approach him, pray to him, and ask for enlightenment on his word, he may seal your mind whereby you would have the seal of God that you had understanding. Eight, then the beasts go into dens and remain in their places. Nine, out of the south cometh the whirlwind and cold out of the north. That's nature. He's kind of Tripping out here just a little bit, he's saying things like, when the north wind blows, it gets cold, and when the south wind blows, it's spring, and it's summer, and it gets warm. That's quite a deduction, 10. But the breath of God, frost is given, by the breath, rather, of God, frost is given, and the breath of the water is straightened. I don't think I would really feel safe in making that statement or calling it a true statement. It's more like Satan's, and I'm speaking from actuality, it's more like the breath of Satan that might bring frost. 
and, and don't, don't take that literal, it's spiritual. I'm speaking spiritually now, all right? I would not dare call God's breath frost, all right? It's just, um, he's warm, and the spirit is warm. As a matter of fact, God is a consuming fire spiritually. That's one of his names. Frost does not necessarily come from fire unless we make refrigeration, and I would not feel comfortable saying that concerning God being the point. And I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to stop there for this lecture. Don't, don't miss the next one. God's finally going to put things in order. And it's important to you that you be able to discern. For God will put things straight. Whereby you will know. God will go into the first earth age. And he will speak of the enemy of this earth age. And God himself you can believe. Man, got 37 chapters of yakety, yakety, yakety. And who do you believe? You believe your father, why he loves you. And God always speaks truth. Man, because of illiteracy, that is to say, and I'm not, I'm, please do not take that as a bad word. There are many things in God's mind that we don't understand. There are many things that we do as we work and as we pray and as we ask His guidance. But the main thing is to know your enemy and to know your friends. But foremost, know your Father. Don't miss the next lecture. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The book of Deuteronomy. The law was given as our schoolmaster. Have you been to school on God's Word? Certainly one way to go there is to study the book of Deuteronomy. Probably the most, the most exciting thing that Deuteronomy has to offer for you is that great song of Moses that those that overcome the false Messiah in the end generation will be singing. The law itself being the schoolmaster that keeps us out of trouble in these flesh bodies. Again, an education in taming that part of you that oftentimes needs taming through the old schoolmaster, that great book, Deuteronomy, the law, and its set ways of keeping you from harm's way even in this generation. You're going to enjoy it. All right, bless your hearts. There we are back again. The 800 number, 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the Spirit moves and you have a question, please share it. Won't you do that? We could no longer, longer answer all questions, but because of the volume of homes, over 100 million around the world at this time that we go into. But we'll take a handful. Yours could be there. Uh, please never ask a question about a denomination, individual, or organization. Let's just teach God's Word and let the chips fall wherever they may. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. You got a prayer request? You don't need the telephone number. You don't need an address. Your father knows what you're thinking right now. So let him know that you love him. That's what he really wants from you is your love. That's why he created you was for his pleasure. And it really pleasures him for you to let him know that you love him. That's a good clue in pleasing God. Father, around the globe we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Amen, amen. Thank you, Father. Okay, let's get into some questions and we're going to go to Alabama. And we've got Kevin. How many times can you repent for sin? Well, Christ said four, uh, seven times 70. That's 490 times. And, you know, I think uh, and many would indicate that's in one day. And I, I hope that we never have a sinner that bad. But be that as it may. Uh, Barry from Connecticut. You read the definition of Easter on, that is to say, the Easter day on one of your programs, and I wanted to know which dictionary you got it from. I have looked everywhere. All I can find is just the standard origin uh, we have been taught. 
Okay, it's Webster's New World Dictionary. It is the third, hear me carefully, the third college edition. Third college edition. And it's very complete and it lets you know the Ishtar pagan holiday from which the name came. Okay, Rick from Michigan. Um, some, I read somewhere or in something about the war in heaven between God and the angels and the beast and his followers. It was quite graphic and detailed as to the events that took place at that time. I have never been able to find it since, and I am not sure what I'm looking for. Well, let's see. You, um, There is a battle in heaven spoken of in Daniel, the 10th chapter, and that has to do uh, in reference to a battle that has already transpired and, and also one that's coming. There is also a battle mentioned in heaven in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, where Michael cast Satan and all of his filthy angels out of heaven. Now, the evil spirits have been allowed upon the earth since Christ took him into captivity by saying, Behind me, and there he sits. Again, his evil spirits can roam the earth, but de facto to be cast in his role as false messiah will happen, and that battle takes place, and then the three woes are written. There is a change that is very graphic mentioned in the 14th chapter of Zechariah that has to do with the changing of bodies. That's also a battle. It's called Armageddon, okay? And um, Revelation mentions Armageddon and Haman Gog, two separate battles. The battle that God himself fights, you will find written in the first few verses of Ezekiel chapter 39. Okay, Nettie from Pennsylvania. I understand the end time signs and realize the false Christ will come first. Is it possible that I am an elect or am I full of myself in thinking that I am? That's, God doesn't play favorites and being one of his elect, that's just a term that means you, you are privy to the understanding of God's word for the fact that the false Messiah does come first. The, the fact that in Romans chapter 11, he makes it very clear that all others, he blinded to that. He sent the spirit of uh, slumber upon them. The word is stupor in the Greek. And you can, you can preach to them all you want to. And they're not going to see it. Why? God himself put a seal over them that they should not. And there's nothing you can do to change that. That's why that you are instructed to plant a seed and leave it alone. If it grows, then tend it. If it doesn't, leave it alone. Uh, so naturally then it uh, remains that one is, uh, is uh, chosen, that is to say, is able to serve God because they are privy to the facts of prophecy. It doesn't make them any better than anyone else. It just makes them enemies of Satan and capable of handing, handling what God would have them do. Davy from South Carolina. My husband makes fun of me and discourages me for studying the Bible. This makes me angry. How do I handle this? Well, study it when he's not around, if that's possible, uh, unless he's around all the time. But um, it, uh, he's probably uh, simply the fact that he's a non-believer, and maybe he isn't. I wouldn't judge anyone. Um, but... Um, uh, don't don't be don't let him discourage you, and he is your husband, and I can give no more advice than that. You know, I believe couples should get along if it be possible. You might read First Corinthians chapter seven; it might help you. Barbara from California, how did the different denominations start? Well, denomination means division, and it's because you've got a good example of it in the book of Job. 
you got three yo-yos and then along comes a fourth and that's about that would ultimately be four denominations right there just preaching out the word of God and actually none of them knew what they were talking about they proved that haven't they I would hope so but that's the way denominations start and I'm, I'm not saying denominations are bad all right Thank God we have all, every church that we have. Else where would we be? Nobody's perfect, and um, uh, I, my only fault with churches is that they do not teach God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Now, naturally, many churches do, so they don't fall under that category. And I'm not talking to them when I say they should do it. Why? Because they are. It's God's Word that is important in God's house. What man might say, you've had a good example of it in this book of Job. Yattity, yattity, yattity. Barbara from Illinois. In whose name should we be baptized in? When you are baptized in the name of, let's say, Jesus, what are you, what are you whose name are you baptized in? What does the word Jesus mean? Many people say, well, it's the Lord. No, I said, what? Define it. It's only transliterated, translated. It comes from the Hebrew title, name, Yeshua. Yeshua. And what does it mean? It means Yahweh's Savior. That's the Father and the Son. And if you understand John 14 at all, you know when the Father and the Son are present also is the Comforter. So you're saying all three. So men have made religions from this. So uh, whatever, you know, uh, a little knowledge becomes a dangerous thing to some people and ignorance can certainly be blissful, can it not? Um, check it out for yourself. Emma from Oklahoma, where at in the Bible did it say that God divorced? Well, I'll tell you where at in the Bible it said God divorced. And it, it's stated in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8, that God divorced his wife Israel, gave her a bill of, writ of uh, wrote her a bill of divorcement. Uh, why? Because she was. Uh, kind of harlot playing the harlot, and God's jealous. Put that in a spiritual sense, and you'll be about there, okay? Divorce is a terrible thing. But, um, and I'll leave that there. Uh, Emily Ann from Alabama, that's a pretty name. I know you say don't get ready for Y2K, but why are the Soviets spending $5 million to get um, all the people ready. I, I didn't say don't get ready. I said it's nothing to be frightened about. You know, there are people that are absolutely going underground because they've been listening to a bunch of yo-yos. Um, as a matter of fact, I've even told people how to get ready for it. And I, I don't want to, if you don't know, any, if, you're, if you don't know how to check a date, then don't try it. But um, uh, there's, there are computers basically that you have purchased in the last two years are ready, okay? Most uh, probably. And there could be some uh, flare-ups. But I don't know where it's written in God's Word that we are supposed to live by the computer. I, I've, I haven't found that. Or I have never read anywhere in God's Word that, the, um, that we were to worship the computer, but that we were to worship God, and God will take care of us. He gave us gray matter up here. And uh, so if you have a computer that you depend on in your business, if you don't know how to check out the fact that if it's Y2K compatible, all you've got to do is print, if you're in, well, see, I don't want to start this because I'm, I'm though I'm pretty good, I'm not an expert, all right? I think an expert is a drip under pressure or something like that. Be, be that as it may. 
But if you type in February, write in date in the DOS, and up pops, you want to correct the date. Well, write, type right in there. and Don't do this on material you haven't filed away or made a backup, all right? Uh, and type in February the 22nd, uh, 2000. And, and then hit, hit return, file it away, and then type in date again and see if it says blank or if it took it. And then see if it advances. See if your programs work on the year 2000. All right? And then you'll pretty well know. No, I didn't say don't get ready. Uh, that would be quite foolish, would it not? But it's not that big a deal. And I know there are... But you don't understand, brother, there are a lot of those little old chips that are pre-burned and burned in. Yeah, and they're in little old dolls, and they're in automobiles, and they haven't got a blessed thing to do with a date anywhere on them. So you don't have anything to worry about. And I, I tell you what, if your, little, if your child has one of those little baby dolls that, that uh, you pull the string and it talks with the chip, and if that little sucker won't talk in year 2000, junk it. Okay, well, the world's not going to come to an end. Worship God. We got along many years without computers, and they're a blessing. They sure are. But don't be frightened, all right? I just don't like to see people get all shook up. Uh, Dennis from Kentucky. Question. When John writes in Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19 about the penalties for adding or taking away from the book, does he mean just the book of Revelation or the whole Bible? The whole Bible. You should, you know, I don't, any man that is worth his salt or woman is not, I, I would hope they wouldn't want to take anything away or add anything to. Now you got to remember what were the languages the originals were written in, all right? And that, that we could spend hours and hours going into. But many times when you have simply a transliteration from the original, you must translate that word to know what it even means. If you're reading something and you don't know what it means, it does not change. In other words, there's no way you can come to an understanding. So you must translate rather than transliterate many words before you can get back to the original. That's not changing it is my point. Okay, Linda from Minnesota. I have a question concerning the unforgivable sin. I know it can only be committed by the elect and when Satan is on earth de facto. All right, you got it. If the sin is the sin just thinking about what you might try to say to Satan. No, 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 no. It, the, trust the Holy Spirit. When you're delivered up, the Holy Spirit will speak to you. Mark 13 gives you a prime example of what you are to do. You're not to premeditate. Now, many people are going to say, well, I wonder what I would say. I'd like to, I'd like to say something to him. Well, just trust the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, it stipulates in Luke chapter 21 that what you say, even the gainsayers are convinced by it, meaning many people will be converted. Tim in Virginia. When I first got saved, I was excited, and I told my friend about your teachings on the rapture. My friend then started reading 1 Thessalonians 4.13 to me, and, um, and I rejected my friend was a, was a rapture... I realized my friend was a rapture believer. The Bible says we should not fellowship with those who would try to lead us astray. So I haven't talked to my friend for several months. Now I want to start talking to my friend. Okay? Well, well, go talk to him. You know, I would hate to think that my Christianity was so weak that I couldn't talk to whoever I wanted to. You, you might even convert him. But... If you want to be friends, you don't have to, to, to preach at him. If he's a good friend and, you know, there's memories in the past and so forth, uh, there's no need in losing a friendship. Don't, don't let him mislead you at the same time, but don't you have control of your mind? I think so. 
So I don't think he will mislead you. Read God's word. Beware listening to men. But that doesn't mean you have to be a stranger to them. Uh, Eric uh, from, uh, I think that's Eric, I'll say that, from California. Is heaven open for people who are mentally handicapped and cannot uh, comprehend God's word? Of course it is. They're innocent, okay? They're innocent. Every, every soul that is innocent is blessed, all right? It's, uh, um, and don't forget, we have the millennium. And when I mention the millennium and past teachings and everything, I'm talking about the Lord's Day, not the millennium change we have coming up at the year 2000. That's not the millennium spoken of in God's Word. At least we don't think it is yet. We'll see. Norm from, uh, Norma from Texas. If the last, in the last hour, if it is a five-month period of the tribulation, then, then what about the Philadelphia church praying that they are kept from the hour of temptation, always also explain Christ's hour of temptation. Well, uh, to escape temptation is to, that they find Satan not tempting, do you? I don't find Satan tempting. I've already escaped the hour that he reigns on earth, that five-month period, because I don't find the character tempting at all. I consider him to be an abomination. So learning truth saves you from the hour of being tempted by Satan because we know who he is. Many will think he's Jesus. I'm out of time. I love you all very much because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in more depth. What's most important, God loves you for it. It makes his day. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, most of all this, you stay in his Word. Every day in his Word is a good day. You know why? Jesus, Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.